Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction, and I'm delighted to be here with you today in Mumbai. Today I'll be talking about steps to tailor your FTO and patent filing strategy in response to the latest SPC case law. So I will be talking about case law. <laughs> so the topics covered will be, I'll introduce some of the requirements for obtaining an F SPC, and then talk generally about some of the major referrals and decisions and the major questions that have arisen. And then the main focus of my um, talk will be on um, Article 3A and what is actually meant by a product protected by a base patent. And this will be exemplified by recent case law. I will then um, conclude my talk by talking about um, practical implications regarding FTO and filing strategy. Okay, so how do you obtain an SPC? So um, this is regulated by Article 3 of um, the Regulation 469 of 2009. And a certificate shall be granted at the date of the application if A, the product is protected by the basic patent in force, B, a valid marketing authorization, so a valid authorization to place the product on the market um, has, been, has been granted. C, if the product has not already been um, subject of an SPC. And D specifies that the um, authorization of B has to be the first marketing authorization. Okay, so just a brief overview of some of the um, major questions that have been um, referred to, uh, referred to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, the CJEU. So in terms of the question, is more than one SP SPC obtainable per basic patent? Um, the Biogen Smith Klein um, Beecham case basically clarified that any holder of a basic patent um, is entitled to an SPC. Um, the a further decision is the um, Octavis Sanofi one, which I'll be talking about later. Um, in the Georgetown decision, which also came out last year, um, the conclusion there was that you uh, can have more than um, one SPC per basic patent. For example, for in this case, it was a um, single substance and a combination of substances. Um, this is linked to the marketing authorization as well. It has to be, it's, n it's not allowed to um, be based on a, on a later marketing authorization. So that was a caveat there. And a pending decision before the CJEU is the Octavis um, Böhringer Engelheim decision. And this deals with post-grant amendments to the, uh, to the claims. Um, another question that was open for a while is what is the maximum period of exclusivity? And the Merck um, versus Accord Healthcare clarified this, that the maximum um, protection is uh, 15 years after the first marketing authorization and must not exceed that. There are a number of uh, marketing authorization issues that have been clarified recently or are still pending. Um, Sumoto Chemicals um, dealt with the, the question of emergency marketing authorizations and if that counts as the first mar marketing author authorization and it was found not to count as the first marketing authorization. Um, there's the AstraZeneca case to do with uh, marketing authorizations in Switzerland and whether they count and there's been a a whole load of um, decisions based on this question, and they're generally seen in Switzerland as the first marketing authorization. Um, and one important case that is still pending before the CJEU is the C Seattle Genetics case. And this is to do with the calculation of the SPC term from what date um, of the marketing authorization counts to, um, to calculate this term. Is it the day that the EMA um, decides on the case, so the, the, the date of the decision, or is it the date 
that the applicant is um, notified of the decision and there are arguments, of, arguments for both. So this can make um, a difference of a few days, which is, as you all know, is very important in the, in the pharmaceutical field. So we're eagerly anticipating the, the resolution of that case or the outcome of that case. Um, another question is, what is an active ingredient within the meaning of Article 1B? And there have been a few cases based on, based on this. And the general principle is, is the, if the active agent has in itself an effect, and as opposed to enhancing the effect of a further active agent, then it, is, then it falls within the, um, the definition of an active ingredient. Okay, so moving on to the main part of uh, my talk, and this is um, regarding Article 3B. So what, how do you determine what product is protected by um, the basic patent? And I'll be discussing this topic um, by referring to these uh, three cases. So starting with the Mediva case, uh, which is a couple of years old now, um, but very important, it was the first, the first question that was re referred along this line to the CJEU, and it clarified some things and left other questions, and also led to other questions. So in this case, there was a combination of active ingredients. So the patent claimed a vaccine for treating whooping cough comprising pertactin and FHA. Marketing authorization um, comprised Protactin and FHA, and there were other active ingredients in there as well. So um, there were numerous um, SPCs filed, including one to the um, core combination, uh, protactin and F FHA, and then further um, SPCs filed to the, those two active agents plus some of some others. So there was, I think, in total five five um, SPCs filed. And the ruling from the CJEU came and said that Article 3A must be interpreted as precluding from grant an SPC relating to active agents that are not specified in the wording of the claim of the basic patent, relied on or in support of the application for such a certificate. So the important thing is here is that the active agent has to be specified in the wording of the claim. So the SPC towards the um, combination of pertactin and FHA was allowed because that was literally in the wording of the claims. But with the addition of a, um, a further agent, ev even though it would fall within the scope of that claim, was rejected. And this, this was also the case even though it was covered by the marketing authorization. Okay, so this suggests that um, suggests the disclosure test, but as I said, there were various questions still open after this, or, or this decision actually led to more questions being asked. So, and further clarification. So, if, you know, is this ruling just limited to fixed combination products? Um, what about if um, you have a specified active agent X with a further active agent that is just um, defined in terms of its functional features as a, a diuretic, for example. And also, how specified is specified? Does it have to be mentioned or named in the claims? What about generic formulations to do uh, markish claims? And um, yeah, what about the question of the, the functional language? So, this idea of um, a combination of a specific agent and a, um, a further active defined by its functional language was addressed or was asked in the um, Actavis uh, Sanofi case. So in this case, there was a marketing authorization for Ibisatan and, for, um, and also for the fixed dose of this active agent with HCTZ. The patent claimed ibisartan and, and also combinations of ibisartan and a diuretic. And the SPC um, applied for 
one case was ivisartan and the second one for the combination of specifically ivisartan and the HCTZ. So Actavis brought the arguments forward that this combination of ivisartan and C, um, HCTZ was not protected since, as, since the, even though HCTZ is a um, diuretic, it was not specified in the application. So, and also the other, the other point was that Ibisatan had already been a subject of an SPC. Unfortunately, in this case, there was no decision um, reached on um, any clarification in terms of 3A. Uh, but there was a ruling about about 3C, um, and as the patent order already had an SPC for the single active active ingredient, um, the court ruled that C, that 3C must be interpreted as preclu precluding the patent holder from obtaining, on the basis of the same patent but a subsequent marketing authorization for a difficult a different medical product. Con containing that active ingredient in con conjugation with another active ingredient, which is not protected as such by the patent. So they're kind of alluding to the fact that they're, they're using the same, um, the same kind of standards as the uh, Mediva um, decision. But, so this idea of disclosure, that as the, the product is not as such protected by the patent, but no conclusive um, ruling was given in this, so, um, but there was a subsequent case um, which also looked at the functional claim language, and this is the Eli Lilly versus human genome sciences. So here, Eli Lilly had developed a neutrokine alpha antibody to Balumab, which was um, in clin clinical trials, and HGS had a, par had a patent covering such antibodies. Um, they had a acquired a marketing authorization for a similar compound, um, belumumab, for treating SLE, which is autoimmune, autoimmune disease. And here, it was seen that HDS may have the opportunity to apply for a SPC um, covering Eli Lilly's um, tabalumab. Okay. So Eli Lilly had recognized that um, the marketing of tabalumab would infringe claim 13 of the HGS uh, patent. Um, I'll show claim, claim 13 in the next slide. And what Eli Lilly did was to initiate um, declaratory proceedings um, such that the SPC should be invalid since, as, since the antibody itself is not specified in the claims. There is only a functional definition um, that would encompass this antibody. And also the specification, there's, there's no disclosure to the antibody um, whatsoever. 